Hi, we are at Long Hall tonight, which is one of the most happening places on SEBA. Tonight we will be uh, with our presenter Lydia Metger from Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and she will be presenting on why some animals here have bizarre pupil shapes. So stick around, we'll be with you shortly, and you will find out. Hello, hello, is this on? Let's, let's make sure that it is on the correct slide. No, don't want to switch sides. Well, welcome everyone to See and Learn 2022, and thank you all for joining us. That beautiful video was produced by Adam with Chizzy Lala Production. Let's give a round of applause for Adam. And also, we'd like to thank Long Haul for hosting us tonight. I think this is our third or fourth presentation at Long Haul. Let's give it up to Long Haul. And we also like to thank Carib Trans, of course, for doing our live stream. We would not be able to do a live stream without Carib Trans. They support us, and we are thankful to them. Round of applause for Carib Trans, please. And also, uh, Prince Bernard Culture Funds and Public Entity of Saba are two of our biggest sponsors. We couldn't do it without them, so a round of applause for them as well. And of course, as some of you all may know, we have over 53 sponsors this year. So a lot of love and a lot of help, and we couldn't do it without them, so some of them are here tonight. Larry and Sherry with Flamboyant Cottage. M that's right, there's a lot of people here tonight, so let's give a round of applause for them. And also in the back, let's give it up. Thank you very much for supporting us. Also, there's a way that you can support by buying a raffle ticket. We have, this is the last night to get a raffle ticket before the pulling on Thursday. So please, if you haven't got a raffle ticket, please do so. Also, we have three extra prizes during the raffle. You can get three entries to the 5K, Busy Bee 5K, that is here on Saba, November 19th. Okay, did we miss anything? Oh, upcoming events. This is the last week. Unfortunately, it's all coming to an end, guys. This has been really, really fun though, right? Yeah. So, tomorrow we have a gecko spotting with presenter Lydia from tonight. And then our last presentation will be on Thursday with Julia at the Busy Bee Breadline Plaza. So please come out, support. Once again, this is your last night to buy raffle tickets. You can buy them at the tent tomorrow as well and on Thursday, right before the pulling, right? So let's get active, everyone, okay? All 
right. Tonight, we are going to be the pupils who learn from a scientist, more specifically an animal pupil expert. Dr. Lydia Magger grew up in a village east of Berlin, Germany. She completed her undergraduate degree and PhD in the UK, followed by postdoctoral work in Australia before moving to the US, where she has been since 2004. Lydia has studied various aspects of animal sensory ecology for over 20 years by studying animal behavior and the mechanisms by which animals sense the world. Lydia is particularly interested in animal vision and coloration and the intriguing relationships between structure and function, whether cephalopods, fish, turtles, or birds. Now, all eyes, get your eyes really big, on Lydia as she gives us a peep into the world of animal vision and what we can see and learn from her work. Round of applause. Thank you so much, all right. Sounds working, thank you so much. Thanks to the foundation for all the logistics. I know it's a lot of work and the sponsors for making this happen. It's an amazing place and it's such an honor to be here and bring to you the next slide <laughs> um, and the following. Um, I just wanna just say very quickly about the um, plan for tomorrow night. There may be some changes because what I was going to do tomorrow night at 7 p.m is hinged upon finding a gecko. Um, and so far, there are several of us who've been keeping an eye out. We have not found a single one. We've found plenty of anoles, but no geckos. So there may be some change. So I don't know how the logistically changes are communicated, but I suspect that's Facebook. So if there, if there is a change, um, social media will let you know. All right. So. I'm into animal vision, I'm into pupils, um, and I guess what more can I tell you than this slide already points out that there are some pretty amazing pupil shapes out there. I think, you know, most of us stop probably at the cat pupil as the weirdest pupil that we see. You know, we have circular pupils, we're so used to it, and the cat has slit, but there are so many weird ones out there. Now, before I really want to delve into pupil shapes, I just wanted to throw out a really basic diagram of an, a human eye and just point out the various structures. So the pupil is essentially the part that is created by the iris, which is a muscle, which is our colored part. So the black spot is obviously the pupil. The lens is not always spherical, you know, in most animals, actually I think in most vertebrates it's probably flattened just like your magnification lens that is, is in the spherical. Fish have spherical lenses, so there's all sorts of shapes there too. Cornea is what protects the eye, sort of like our first layer of protection to the light rays that we don't want going to the retina. The retina lines basically the entire back of the eyeball to a point where visually it's no, no longer important, but it, you know, it goes from all the way up to through here. Optic nerve is where the signal is um, basically sent to the brain. Now, most animals, vertebrates and invertebrates, believe it or not, have a pupil, so even insects have pupils. And all, I, all pupils generally respond to light by constricting, and that, you know, obviously, that's what most of us think of, is that it limits the amount of light that enters the eye. Now we know um, circular pupils most certainly because we're used to them and then we know slit shaped pupils. Um, most of us are probably not familiar with pinhole pupils but now it gets a little weird and then there's a fourth group that I've termed elaborate just for lack of a better word just because it is so bizarre and so uh, um, you know complex in, the, in their shape. Circular pupils we have them, dogs have them, that's Tilly who's sitting here when he was about two. Um, and up and up in here, maybe, I think in some of the slides it won't be covered by a bulb, but I've um, put a diagram that shows what the pupil does in low light situations as well as in bright light. So look out for that in case I forget to point it out. So obviously a circular pupil, ours, will um, you know, be dilated at night and then it constricts during daytime. And as far as light sensitivity is concerned, 
our pupil changes from about two millimeter in bright light to about eight millimeter in darkness, and that gives, that's an area change of about um, 15 fold. So moving right along, we have circular pupils in turtles. Um, we have them in birds. We have them in some of the sharks as well. This is a hammerhead here. And again, it changes um, during day and night. We have them in fish as well. Now, in fish, the story is slightly different because fish pupils don't change. They just sort of stay the way they are, so they're not light responsive. But what fish essentially do is, instead of closing the pupil to you know, limit the amount of light they, they want to have at the retina, they do vertical migrations in the water column. So a lot of fish end up sort of coming up at night to feed when there's low, less light, and they go to greater depths during the daytime. Um, and then the other cool thing that fish do is they have, in the retina, they have specialized um, pigment cells that basically function in a similar way to these, um, you know, those glasses that some people wear that, you know, when you step outside and they go dark to protect, you know, as sun shades and you step back in and then they basically clear. So fish have the same thing, they basically, or some fish species, they have the same thing where they basically sort of like a pigmentation that comes to the front sort of shades um, the retina and protects it from too much light. So f moving along, in some fish we have circular pupils with sort of like an added um, structure at the front, so it makes it a little bit like an oval shape. That's called an aphakic gap. Um, it's, sort of, it's essentially when you imagine like having two circular, two eyes on the front with circular pupils, and it's sort of like a cutout section that comes to the front, so it adds a little bit of um, binocular overlap so that the, the fish basically is able to see a little bit more towards the front. And interestingly enough, um, the backside where, you know, the light rays would hit the retina, there's more photoreceptors there. So it really is sort of like an extension of their visual field. And you see it in the anatomy as well. Vertical slit shapes moving right along. We have them in cats. We have them in snakes. So they move, they basically change from a circular shape under or near circular under low light to these slits. Um, snakes have them as well, just a little side note. Most venomous snakes have slit-shaped pupils. Most non-venomous have circular pupils, if you want to get that close to find out. Um, except for the coral snake that is venomous and has a circular pupil, so there's always exceptions to the rule. Now, with the, as far as light sensitivity is concerned, the area change of the slit pupil is about 135 fold. And I forgot to mention with the um, circular pu pupil earlier, it, it, that essentially what it means in terms of the light, that light and, uh, sensitivity that that gives the eye, that's about 1.2 log units. If you don't you know, remember your log stuff's like 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, et cetera. Now this basically is 10 times that. Uh, we basically, with the cat pupil, this is uh, twice that, so it's uh, 2.1 log units sensitivity uh, range that this gives the eye. So essentially what, what's happening with the slit shape pupils is that these eyes are really made for vision in darkness with the added daytime vision just because it is evolutionarily needed for them to also function during daytime. But if you have a retina that's really sensitive at low light and you go into bright light, it's way too much light. So somehow we need to find a mechanism by which we can reduce the amount of light that reaches the retina. And this is a really uh, effective way of doing it, better than a circular pupil. We have vertical slit-shaped pupils um, in some of the elasmobranchs as well. This is a black tip reef shark that uh, we, I think, I don't know what the, the species exactly is that we gotta get off the key, uh, coast here, but we def definitely have uh, reef sharks here. And we have not only vertical slit shapes, we also have horizontal slit shapes. This is a, a goat. Um, down here is a peacock flounder. But I put a question mark right next to it because peacock flounder right off the coast here. Because I don't even, quite, I'm not really quite sure I want to call this just a straight kind of horizontal slit shape pupil because it has this really interesting kind of lip down the bottom there that makes it just a little bit odd. So I'm not really quite sure what, what's happening with that. Nobody's really looked at it. Octopus has a, a, vert, a um, horizontal slit. Now with the goats though, I just want to point out that 
are coming back to them. They're horizontal, but they're actually are moving them into a different category altogether because they're really complicated pupils. And now we're moving into the realm of slightly weird pupils. This is the gecko. The gecko has a pinhole pupil. Um, so under low light, um, this is again up here is low light, and then during bright light it makes these pinholes. So it moves right, it makes, you know, it sort of ups the ante on a slit chair pupil that the cat has by adding, closing it even further, and just allowing a few <coughs> spots, a few tiny, tiny holes for the light to get through. Now, what the gecko is able to do by that is cut down light by more than a thousand fold. So now th this animal is even better than the cat. You know, it can hunt during the night, as we know, they're out active during the night. Um, but it's still no fool during the day. It can still kind of, you know, get away from predators during the day and see just, as, just enough. Now, as you saw from the introduction slide, there's some really, really bizarre pupil shapes out there. And that's what I'm going to be talking for the, about for the rest of the talk, these things that I've called elaborate pupils. Now, we found these elaborate pupil shapes in four animal groups. The first ones are the ungulates, they're the hoofed animals, they're the goats, horses, sheep, those kinds of animals. Second ones are the teleos, the bony fish. Third are the elasmobranchs, those are the sharks and the rays. And then we found them in some cephalopods, the squid, cuttlefish, and the octopus. And I'll be going through each one of those in turn. Ungulates. I said it earlier, the goats um, have a horizontal slit chair pupil, but when you look really closely, um, they have this additional structure lining the iris, which tur actually turns this into a really elaborate pupil shape. So I'll show you what I mean. This is the same goat from earlier, but the image didn't come out all that great, and I think this is doing, the lighting is not that great. But right in here, there's a sort of structure that kind of comes down. You can see a deer right in here too. It has this thing. It's called a corpora nigra. I don't know why they call it that, because I think for lack of a more descriptive term, I think it sort of doesn't really do it much justice, I think. But um, this is a llama. This is a image that I found on the, on the web. Uh, hippo down here. This is another horse picture right there. And this is a mouflon, um, it's also some kind of a sheep. And this is a horse, and what you can see is that this structure here, I've kind of magnified a little bit, it's almost like a baseball cap, it sort of sticks out. Incidentally, with goats, another interesting thing that goats do, when they lower their head to graze, and then they lift their head to stay up, their eyes roll. So their pupil always stays horizontal like this. It's really amazing. So there is some point to having a pupil shape this way. They, they really need it that way. They want it that way. Um, so the second group, group are the teleost. Those are the uh, bony fish. And there's some very strange fish that nobody's really looked at as far as the eyes are, eyes are concerned. The, this is the false stonefish. Nobody knows what this pupil does in, in darkness or in bright light. Um, it's an Indo-Pacific animal. This is like a sort of an Eastern Atlantic. Goes down like the, the, I think it goes down like the Carolinas maybe as well a little bit. It's a stargazer. Again, it's a crazy fish. This one has like some venomous spines. It has acoustic organ that can deliver electric shock. It's a big one too. Um, and has these quite interesting eyes that look up, hence the name stargazer. This is a crocodile fish. I think there's some flathead species right off here as well. And it has this amazing structure right over the eye there. And again, nobody knows down here with, you know, with a you know, nighttime, daytime response, no idea. Nobody's ever looked at them. Moving right along to the elasmobranchs, those are the, um, the um, sh sharks of the rays and the skates. Most of the sharks have circulars or slit-shaped pupils. It's the, um, the skates and the rays that have extremely elaborate pupils. So this is a gray nurse shark circular or uh, has like some, t some of them have like a, um, a diagonal slit shaped pupil and this is a wobbegong um, these are wobbegongs right here and this is a chain dogfish the slit always is, is pointing towards the nose which is another interesting thing and now these are the skates in the rays and they have these extremely frilly pupils this is the common skate that goes down like the carolinas there's a, there's a couple of um, um, rays off the coast here too that have these crazy pupils. Um, this on the side here, sorry, I was just going to point out quickly. Um, this is some infrared imaging that I've done to 
basically show how it moves from circular um, to you know bringing this pupil pupil down and closing it up. Stingrays, these are the ones out on the Great Barrier Reef, but there's some um, stingrays off here as well. And lastly, we found them in some of the cephalopods, squid, cuttlefish, and the octopus. Not so much in the squid and the octopus. They're a little more simple. It's the cuttlefish that are really complex. And here are some images of that. That's um, sepia bandensis, which is sort of like over to more towards the, uh, the um, Indo-Pacific. Um, sepia palma is a southern Australian species, and sepia officinalis is um, a European kind of comes down the African coast into the Atlantic. And again, I've got this infrared Im imaging that shows the W shape during um, bright light, and then it goes towards circular under low light conditions. So why aren't all pupils shaped the same way? I mean, I, you know, when I first started looking at this, so I get circular. I mean, I get slit shape. That's sort of. I mean, I might even get the gecko pinhole thing. Although for that, I have to say. Um, you know, how do you compute, how does the brain compute four spots of whatever, how many spots the different species have when you just have four, you know, essentially have four images on the retina, you still may have to turn it into one image. So those are the kinds of questions that you start asking yourself uh, when you look at this. Um, and so why, why are these extremely elaborate pupil shapes? So that brings it down to like one question, why are pupils shaped the way they are? Now, in order to answer that question, you need to look at all sorts of different things. So you need to look at the body shape. You need to look at their lifestyle. We need to look at the habitat light field, because after all, the eye is there for seeing, so we need to be, we need to be able to tell what um, exactly is happening in the light field. And last but not least, we also need to know about the eye optics and the processing. This is uh, called a sensory ecology approach. So I sort of think of myself as a sensory sensory biologist or visual ecologist, that, that sort of thing. So, you know, you're interested in, you're asking questions about, you know, what is the information that is obtained? Um, how is the animal collecting this kind of mechanism, this, um, this sort of information? So we're asking questions about the mechanism. And then what is the animal uh, doing with it? You know, why is it useful? So it's asking questions about function. So I'll be going through these four things in turn. Um, first of all, we'll talk about body shape. So when we look at these elaborate pupil shapes, there are some common, common features that emerge. The first of all is that all of these animals have their eyes on the side of the head. Um, animals that have their eyes in the front of the head don't have these kinds of pupil shapes. Second thing is that they all have a really broad visual field which is also you know, really uh, a key point, and they don't have much of a binocular overlap. They have binocular overlap, but it's not very much. The aquatic animals, such as the uh, lasmobranchs and the cephalopods, are also ventrally flattened, so they're basically like flatfish, or they're sort of like more this way than sort of um, you know, vertically up the way we are. And most importantly, we don't see those pupil shapes in eyes that are facing forward. About lifestyle, Again, some common features emerge. Ungulates often feed in open fields and they're pre uh, prey, so they have the flea strategy. So they basically, you know, they're out. If they see something, they're gone. Um, the aquatic species are all sit and wait predators, so they kind of like bury into the substrate or, you know, sit someplace nice and still and s wait until something comes near and then they pounce on it. They can also sometimes be prey to other animals, so they're often concerned with being camouflaged for two reasons, for catching their prey so they're not detected, as well as hiding away from um, predators that might have them for lunch. So all of these animals basically scan the horizon for things that are interesting to them. That's one key um, thing that's happening here. An interesting study that was done a few years ago on when you know, we talk about lifestyle is that um, this group out in Berkeley was looking at um, over 200 land animals, and in particular cats they were looking at, and they found that in cats you have vertical or slit shape, um, slit vertical slit shape or round pupils, and depending on how tall you were, you were either a vertical slip or a round. And it, the cat has a slit shape pupil, the lion doesn't, the lion has a round pupil, and it has to do with height because it has to do with blur, so how much blur you may experience, visual blur, as you're looking through brush, you see, looking through objects on the ground. And that would give you an advantage as a predator. So that was a very, very interesting study. 
Um, now, another thing that I did in, in our lab was I looked to see whether the pupil could actually be involved in camouflage. And I will show you some results on that because the answer is possibly yes. And here's what I did. We did two experiments. Um, and we were just talking about checkerboards have been used everywhere. They're very, very useful. So we placed um, skates on checkerboards as well as some natural substrates. Um, I'll just put this slide up right now so you have the comparison. But first of all, I know the, I know the, um, the size of this eye. So I can basically make checkerboards of any size that I want. Um, and the cool thing with checkerboards is that no matter what, how, how many checkers, you know, one, no matter what the size is, you always have the same amount of light reflected. So whether I have 200 here or 100 there or 50 there, it's always the same amount of reflected. So it's a nice way to control things and, um, and be able to change your know, variables one at a time. And it's, it's a good, good sort of a system to work with. Um, we also place them on natural substrates here. We place them on sand, some small gravel, and some large gravel. But now this becomes a little bit more difficult because now I have to control for size, and I also have to look at how much light's reflected. So that's what these graphs show here. The sand is small, then the gravel is a little bit larger, but you know, some variation. It's a standard deviation. It's this large gravel. And then down here, um, I also have to make sure that all of these, you know, these three substrates reflect the same amount of light because you know, if one of them is brighter than the other, then the people might be responding to that, and I didn't want that to happen. So this shows that about the same amount of light is, re is uh, reflected off these substrates. That's what, what this shows here. These are the results. With the checkerboards, we saw that this is a measure of light. So this is low light. This gets a little bit brighter. This gets um, brighter. We see that no matter what sub, which, which of those substrates they were on, so you know, this is the small check, medium check, large check, they kind of did the same thing. They sort of had the pupil quite open on a brighter light intensity, same thing, about the same. And then as it got brighter, they also didn't really respond any different, wh you know, whether I had them on this check, that check, or that check. But overall, the pupil, you know, basically opened up as I increased the light. Now, on the natural substrates, a slightly different story emerged. Um, on you know, the, the lowest light intensity, their eyes were just a t little bit more closed on sand, a little more open on the, on the slightly larger substrate, and a little bit more open on the larger rocks, and I did that the same way for the different light intensities. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is where you have to sort of start thinking about, well, why didn't they, why didn't they do it there? Why did they do it on the s natural substrates and not the checkerboards? The cue to that is that on the substrates, they were allowed to bury in, and only the ice was sticking out. On the checkerboards, I put them right on top. They couldn't bury into you know, a laminated piece of substrate. So when you think about a, a predator approaching this animal trying to either eat it or a, some prey species trying to get away from it, you are comparing that eye against the background that it is on. So if the skate's on there, the eye is still part of the skate. I see the whole skate. Whereas in here, the eye is, the skate's buried. I only see the eye, so I'm comparing the eye against the substrate. So it makes sense for this animal to take its cues from the substrate that is surrounding the eyes and say, all right, I'm on sand. This is really, really small grain stuff. So I'll close my eye just a little bit more uh, compared to these other ones. And for that, it saw itself, right? It basically saw it's, because the, on the skate, this, the, um, the fins basically go all around, the body goes all around. The third point that I needed to talk about was um, habitat light field. And um, so when we have animals with these elaborate pupil shapes, we find that um, there are some common light field features that they all have, that they share. Um, the ungulates in particular, they basically are in these sort of open grass fields. Um, I put this image in here because deer obviously ob sometimes also go into the woods for shelter, but for the most part, as far as grazing is concerned, they'll be coming out into these fields. The um, aquatic animals are usually in these sort of open kind of underwater scenes. And the problem with these, thing, with these kind of environments as far as light's concerned is that 
the light is usually really bright from above because that's where the sun is and it, it gets you know, dimmer towards the horizon. That's a problem for, vi for vision um, because the retina essentially has to somehow be able to deal with these sort of massive differences in, in light intensity. And I'll get back to that in a little while. So when we characterize light field, um, there's, a, there's a few different methods that are available to us. There's spectrometers, there's radiometers. But we found, this is a colleague of mine um, out in Sweden who's come up with this, with this method, um, Dan Nielsen, and um, um, also Mike Bock, who's come here before. And what, what uh, they've basically started doing was just use a, um, a regular, whoop, that went a little too far, a regular SOR camera with a fisheye lens in front of it. Um, and then you essentially go out and you just take a ton of just habitat shots out wherever you are. Um, usually about you know, 10 to 30 images per habitat. And then what you end up doing is you just take all these images and start working on the pixels. So we don't even really interested in the um, image details and the objects in the image. We're just interested in um, the information as far as intensity, light intensity is concerned. So what emerges from these habitats is that this here would be the horizon, so this would be 90 degrees facing up. This would be the horizon, and this is 90 degrees facing down. And over here we have basically the spectral photon radiance, so we're measuring the amount of light that is available for vision. So it's a lot up here, it goes down and it stays down. So you know, there's basically a really strong intensity gradient there. Yep, I just said that, good, all right. This can be a problem for vision. Now, what I found with these elaborate pupils is that when you do some mathematical modeling, you can actually show that what the pupil does is it helps even out this light field and makes it a little bit more even for the retina so that vision is a little bit easier for the animal. And I can show you exactly how we did this. So we collected a ton of images of the pupil shape from different areas of viewing around the animal. So if you take a skate, for example, and I start kind of collecting images around, you know, different areas like this with my special infrared camera. You essentially see images like this. So this is the optical axis right in front of the animal. This is 30 degrees behind it, 60 degrees, 90 degrees. Up here I don't see anything because the skate can't see quite as well back here. Um, and, um, you know, we generally collect something like 30 to 60 images all around the animals, as many as I possibly can. Um, we measure the pupil areas, and then we essentially combine these measurements with the light field data that I showed just, just in the last slide. So essentially what, we, what I end up getting is this. So this is showing all of these individual spots are... Ima are, are there because that's where I took an image of the animal. So from these, you know, so basically, this is the optical axis right in front. This is above. This would be as far lower as far as I can get, you know, on a skate or a cuttlefish that's sitting on the bottom. You can't, you know, go from right. This is uh, the back of the animal. That's the front, and we call those optical throughput images. So 57 images in total. Now I take that graph that I showed earlier with, with the light information, and it's a simple product. I just basically find from that spot, find the equivalent here, from that spot, find the equivalent here, and so on and so on. And that's what I end up coming up with. Um, and what I want to point out is that this is the brightest areas, so that's where most of the light goes through to the retina, and that area here has moved up a little bit. And that means that the these types of pupils essentially make that light field that is so bright at the top and dimmer at the horizon more even. And it's essentially similar to us placing a hand in front of the eye when I'm being lit by a light or when you're stepping out of the house and you have the sun in your face and you go like this. So that's essentially what these pupils do. More even illumination for the retina, it's better for vision. So. Another thing to think about is also activity levels and different light intensities. And we have different, you know, different kind of um, sort of, you know, situations where you might want to be active. You might be diurnal, you know, day active. You might be a night active, nocturnal animal. Crepuscular is sort of a really difficult time um, for, for vision to function properly. That's sort of like dusk and dawn. And cathemeral means that it's sort of an irregularly active, but can be day or night. And there are quite a few animals out there. So when I 
look at activity levels as a function of pupil shape and I just sort of kind of, you know, group in a simple circular and I get them, you know, more complicated, more complicated into, uh, until I get to these elaborate pupil shapes. And I try to just plot those as a function of kind of intensity levels. So this is really dark. This is, you know, crepuscular. This is the daytime levels. Um, it turns out that we have, you know, and down, down here I've sort of said nocturnal or diurnal, and it turns out that towards here we're cathemeral. Um, I think you can see a pattern, right? I think we're either day active or night active, day or sort of like down to crepuscular, day gecko was mostly day active cat. The darker areas where the cat is mostly active, but you know, day to night, et cetera, et cetera. And now we get to these elaborate pupil shapes, and it turns out that they're actually active day and night. They, you know, they have rest periods, but it's not bound to a specific time of day or night. They actually um, end up being able to see in all of these light conditions. Last but not least, eye optics and processing we also need to look at. So when, you know, if any of us have ever kind of picked up a textbook on just uh, vision or this kind of thing, what the optical function of a pupil is usually described as it is there to um, optimize resolution. And that is sort of, um, you know, it, it gets into optics a little bit, but essentially what it means is that um, when light passes, through, a, through an aperture and through a lens. If it's way too small, you get diffraction. You know, it's like a, a um, sort of a, you might remember that from as a slit, you know, if it's way too small, you get diffraction. So it's not a clean pass right through to the retina. Um, or the the um, other extreme of that is if the aperture is way too big and all this light passes through the lens, you get aberration, which is the other side, the other side of that coin is essentially that the image isn't focused well on the retina, so it's like, um, if you have a magnification glass and you hold it, you know, above a newspaper or whatever, only the letters right in the center will be focused. The other ones won't be, it's just because it's not, it's basically the way that it passes through the lens, just, it needs to be just right. And what the pupil does is it essentially keeps the lens just in the right sort of dimensions for everything to be focused. Um, next thing is it maximizes depth of focus, but again, like, you know, this is sort of like a uh, camera f-stop, um, but um, I think what we can say about that is we are able to accommodate. So, you know, our, our eyes and animal eyes are generally able to, you know, use the muscle, te you know, technology, the muscle uh, to, you know, pull the lens in a way that we need for the f um, image to be focused. Um, enhancing sensitivity during dark adaptation makes sense. If you're stepping out, it needs to open up to let light in. Um, if you're stepping into darkness, I'm sorry, the other way around, if you're stepping into darkness, it, it basically needs to open. If you're stepping out, it needs to close to let just the right amount of light in. And it needs to protect the retina from having way too much light in it. But as I've just, uh, you know, just pointed out, um, the pupil is not just cutting out light. So when you think about the, um, the range of, um, sort of light intensities that are available, for, available out there, it's 10 to the power of 10. So like a massive range from darkness to like bright sunlight. Um, whereas we've just seen that, you know, the, the pupils basically just cut out light by a very, very small chunk. So light intensity can't be the, the pupil's only function. So aspects to consider as we are trying to figure out like why we have these elaborate pupil shapes. We need to look at the shape of the eye, the lens, the retina, figure out what the visual field is. And we also need to look at features of, of the retina. Um, in particular, we're interested in the cells that are in the retina that basically enable the image to be formed in the first place. And we also need to start looking at uh, which part of the environment is, is projected onto the retina. Um, and how the pupil affects image formation. So, first one is to look at eye design. Now, as I pointed out earlier, eyes are always on the side of a head and we have wide field horizontal vision without compromising much of the vertical field. So this is a cuttlefish, for example. And the cuttlefish has almost 180 degree surround view with a little bit of binocular overlap in its horizontal field. And the vertical field has about 130 degrees. It, it might actually be more because it's kind of difficult to measure a cuttlefish from, from beneath. Um, skate similar, about 180 degrees, about 10 degrees overlap. Um, it most likely has more than that, but it's impossible to me measure a skate just because it, you know, the side of the skate goes out like that. It definitely has more than 95. 
And a horse, it's kind of interesting because I never um, was able to find a measurement for the vertical light field of the horse. Everyone's concerned about the horizontal field. Um, in people, we have about 120 um, degree vertical. Uh, we have 70 below and 50 above, so 100, 120 total. And our, horizo our horizontal is 135 for each eye. So we can already see 135 for human, 180, 180, you know, um, and then 120 up and down. And I don't think that 130 is correct. If somebody actually went there and, and tried to measure it more accurately, I bet you we'd find, we'd find more than that. And horse, my guess is probably more than 120 just from the way that, you know, the horse's eye is positioned. Looking at eye designs, this is some of the work that, uh, that allows us to study eyes. We can, um, we can use um, CT and micro CT machines, so we can actually really start scanning some of these intricate structures. And the idea with this is to create a 3D reconstruction of the eyes, so we can do some mathematical modeling and actually be able to, you know, calculate if light rays come in from a particular direction, what's it actually do on the retina. And um, secondly, we look at the retina. We need to look at the cells that are basically making vision possible in the first place. And the cells that are of, of um, most interest are the ganglion cells and the photoreceptor cells. So the ganglion cells are the ones that, the nerve cells that are essentially turning this information into something the brain can, can, um, can do something with. And these are the photoreceptors that are usually in a sort of like a mosaic and this looks complicated, but it's not really all that complicated. It's basically showing the distribution of these different cells in the retina um, that is dissected out of the eye. So there, there is a way that you can essentially dissect a retina out of an eyeball. Um, but when something is sort of like cup-shaped, you need to be able to put it on some sort of a microscope slide. But, you know, something is shaped like this is really difficult. So you end up sort of cutting into it in various um, spots. So if you were to glue this back together, it would basically be like this. So this is a retina flattened, and the reason for these cuts is that I made those. Um, this is photoreceptors, these, is gang these are ganglion cells. So when we're looking at these, um, these images here, everything that is dark is not a lot of cells. Everything that's white is a lot of cells. Same thing here. Anything that is dark is not a lot of cells the wider areas are a lot of cells. When we try to make sense of ganglion cells and photoreceptors, we have to remember that there is not, so the photoreceptors are the, the layer that basically the light hits first, and then after that are the ganglion cells. In humans, that's actually kind of wrapped around. But as far as, as, far as imaging is concerned, it's photoreceptors first, then the ganglion cells, and then it goes to the brain. You have not one photoreceptor and one ganglion cell. There's always a group. There's be a group of photoreceptors to one ganglion cell. And depending on how many photoreceptors you have per that one gang ganglion cell, you can tell whether you know an eye is, uh, is there for spatial vision. So say if you had only a small group of uh, photoreceptor per one ganglion cell, then you'd say, yes, I mean, you know, this is about like making sure that you can see small detail. If you have a large group of photoreceptor per one ganglion cell, you'd say, this eye is really made, or this part of the retina is made for catching light. And this is essentially what's happening here. So we have, you know, different kind of, you know, just um, densities of these different cells in the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells. And that's what's called retinal summation is when I'm trying to figure out like, well, what's the eye really doing? Is it concerned with spatial resolution or with sensitivity? And it's the ratio of retinal summation, it's the ratio of photoreceptor density to ganglion cell density. And what ends up coming out of this calculation is that these white areas here, for example, um, um, have relatively low spatial summation, so it's like a small number of photoreceptor per ganglion cell. So they're involved in spatial resolution. It happens to be the top side of the back side of the retina so it's the part that looks forward and down. Kind of makes sense. So it's, I think it's looking for things that move, looking for the substrate, um, you know, sort of spatial details for camouflage, those kinds of things. 
um, and the rest of the retina is more concerned with light intensity. The other thing that's really important to point out here is that we have a horizontal streak. So we essentially, you know, we have a horizontal retina already. That's elaborate, but it's a horizontal retina. Um, pupil, not retina. Um, and we find that horizontal shape also reflected at the level of the retina. Same with the ganglia cell. We sort of have the sort of a horizontal streak, just the same as the pupil. Um, and then the retinal summation just turns it in. This is, this is the real story. So this is where we know what the eye is actually about, like what it wants to see. These horizontal visual streaks are sometimes called area centrales. It's sort of like the highest cell density. That's what that refers to. So from when I started looking at this, I kind of realized that there seems to be a correlation between pupil shape and ganglion cell, um, cell dis distribution. And so when we look at the elasmid ranks in particular, there's a variation in pupil shape and ganglion cells. So if I, if I start like plotting again from simple eyes to more the elaborate ones, turns out that the simple ones have a more simple distribution of these ganglion cells. The dogfish gets a little more complicated and the stingray even more. So with the dogfish, we usually have like two or three of these like spotted areas. With the um, stingrays, we have a lot more. So I don't know if you can see the very last sentence down the bottom here, but what that indicates uh, is that pupil shape, shape is very likely involved in, sp in, um, um, in spatial resolution of the eye and figuring out what is important spatially for the eye. So in summary, I guess I think I want to just uh, point out again that body shape's really important. All these animals have the, um, the, with these elaborate pupils, have their eyes on the side of the head for wide field horizontal vision. The lifestyle is also quite similar. They basically are active day and night. Um, they scan the horizon for important things and there's a potential camouflage function there too. Habitat light field is uh, also very similar in terms of um, you know, having that sort of very strong intensity gradient. And the, the role of the pupil here is to really help even out that intensity gradient. Lastly, the eye optics and the processing um, it shows that you know the more complex the pupil shape, the more complex the retinal, the ganglion cells, and that it shows quite clearly that pupil shape is really important in providing vision. Now, the last few slides are sort of more general terms. So, why do we even study pupils? What's what's so cool about it? Other than that, it is really cool, and it is sort of a, you know makes for some very nice pictures and some nice stories. But when we think about the eye as a vi uh, imaging apparatus. Um, our eyes are always going to be superior, or animal eyes in general, always going to be superior to any human-made counterpart, any camera that we can ever create. Just in, la in the last few years, we've moved from RGB, red, green, blue um, cameras, to including multispectral, hyperspectral imaging, um, but we're just still not going to be able to beat an eye. An eye is still going to be so much superior. So what can we learn about pupils in particular as we are trying to implement these kinds of things and maybe feed information to optical engineering and technology and how could we possibly do this. This is a slide that shows um, a faulty um, diaphragm in an SOR camera and the reason I put this in is it shows that if you have a faulty sort of a um, you know um, piece of machine there for us as we're taking pictures around, you know, in our families and stuff, it won't matter. I mean, we wouldn't notice. Um, if you have a, you know, if you just, uh, just look at these four images here, essentially what happens is that anything that is, um, um, that is sort of not I right at the, uh, at the focal point be slightly out of focus, will make these irregular blur circles here. So which to us won't matter because, you know, we're basically focusing things properly. But um, if you imagine the extremes of imaging, you know, in microscopy or in astronomy, those kinds of things really are important as you, you know, when you especially start thinking about how images provide the information for mathematical modeling, etc. Then again, maybe this is something cool to think about and this, I'll show you this in the next slide. I don't know if, any, if there are any photographers out here, but anyone who's interested in photography, there's this thing called bokeh, which just makes sort of a really artistic um, spin on things. So um, this is my little favorite Leica. 
if you put this camera on f about any SLR camera will do this, um, point and shoot cameras won't. Um, put it on 50 millimeter and a, and a low f-stop number needs, you need to have a, a low f-stop number, I usually put on like, you know, about f maybe five, something like that. Um, and you put a little piece of paper on the front with a little cutout. Um, in f when I, when this is, you know, fully focused, this is just like a string light. Um, when I, when it's slightly out of focus, it basically turns the string light into the, into a star shape, just like what this is. And that's called bokeh. Um, and then you can start creating images like that. You sort of have, you know, some background features with a heart shape, and uh, this is that heart shape with that um, star shape again, like this. So, you know, photographers get really into that kind of stuff. And it shows, pupil shape, you know, that's, that's a pupil. Coded aperture, so this again is um, a really interesting application where uh, coded aperture is essentially blocks or unblocks light in a known pattern. And this is a use in X-ray and gamma ray because those kinds of rays sort of pass through any mirrors and any, um, you know, those kinds of glass and stuff like that. Um, and um, a regular aperture will create sort of, um, you know, a regular image on the detector plane, whereas a coded aperture, which is this kind of thing, it's kind of hidden behind the light bulb here. I don't know which one it is, doesn't matter. Um, basically creates this sort of um, irregular kind, of, it's, called, it's called a shadow, but essentially it creates this sort of pattern on the detector plane. And, um, oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, and so essentially what, this is the sort of uh, an example of the earliest form. Can you move it back up? So I can, yep. Perfect. Um, so, when you then apply, you know, mathematical algorithms to this, you essentially can tell from those, from that one image, you can basically zoom right, sort of zoom right through it and find um, the properties from the original light source or the object can be detected, can be deduced from just from that shadow. So you can essentially zoom right through it and find different focal points there. And there are some cameras that are available to buy, rate, um, uh, Lytra and Raytrix they're called. So they're essentially, you know, it's, it's mathematical computation how your, you know, which image you want out of whatever you took there. Um, this is uh, an interesting kind of thing when I found that. It's um, a appli potential application similar to an elaborate pupil when NASA sort of made these sunshades as they're trying to image distant stars because it's very difficult to take an image into a bright sun like that. So, you know, if you basically blast out some sort of a, a instrument that then opens up and creates this sort of um, elaborate pupil shape, if you want, um, that would allow you to start imaging some of those things in astronomy. And then the last point is more about ed education. In the last few years, we've, you know, there's been a lot more focus on STEM in education. And the reason for that is that I think we've all realized that the subjects are still often taught in isolation. We're doing math in isolation, you know, we're doing engineering, we're doing um, science, um, technology, we're doing everything in isolation instead of pulling them together and realizing that the world is intertwined, everything is connected. We can't just like be teaching one thing and ignoring the other. And you can put the A into that and make it not STEM, but STEAM. Um, and I think my work in particular lends itself really nicely to a STEM or a STEAM approach. And my work's not the only work. I mean, as you know, there's a lot of people's projects out there that are really showing um, how everything is connected um, and you know how we need to start embracing the STEM or the STEAM kind of subjects um, more as, as a whole. And with that, I would like to say thank you to the foundation again and the sponsors. And these are some of my students that have been involved um, in this project and my collaborators, in particular Dan out in, um, in Sweden, Mike Bock, who's been here, and some of my colleagues at the MBL, and Justin, who was my postdoc advisor many, many years ago. Um, thank you, and with that, I'll take questions. Let's see if my kids have questions. <laughs> Not about food, though, please. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question about cats and blur. Mm -hmm. So the example that you used was a house cat and a lion. Mm -hmm. And lions live on the savannah where they feel like a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about a big cat like a tiger that lives in a tropical area with lots of trees? Would you expect to see more of a, a slit shape or more of a round shape? 
You know what? Off the top of my head, I can't remember whether the tiger has a slit shape now. Um, the, oh, the question was, um, so going back to that example that I gave, the cat has a slit shaped pupil and the, li the lion has um, a round pupil and the lion usually hunts in open fields, whereas a tiger with similar height is um, possibly has more obstructed vision in the jungle. Um, you know, I have to admit that I'm not a cat specialist whatsoever and I know, don't know off the top of my head whether a tiger has a slit shaped pupil. So I'm gonna have to defer on that and um, May, I don't know, do you happen to know since you... I want to say it's round as well, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. It has to do with, it basically has to do with, with um, as you, you know, if, if you imagine sort of like being low and like, you know, scanning through people like this versus being a little bit further up and scanning through, there's a lot more blur that my vision needs to deal with as I'm looking through a lot of objects to get to what I want to see. And the slit shape pupil just helps. The tiger, again, is taller off the ground, and I want to say that it likely has a, a round shape. Tiger is round, thank you very much. It's problem solved. Yeah, so it basically has to do with height. Jaguar as well, yeah. It would be interesting, you know, at what point, like what height, you know, whether, you know, some of the smaller cats will probably at some point. Another you know, interesting thing that I have found was um, foxes have slit shaped pupils too, so, you know, with, as you're going into the sort of canines, there's some differences there as well, yeah. Yeah. The fly eyes. Insects. How much research done on fly eyes? Um, there is there is a, a big, big, big field um, looking at all sorts of things related to fly vision. I mean, there's a lot of challenges there too, um, as far as speed is concerned. You know, reactivity. Um, you know, if you think of dragonflies hunting and catching a fly out of the air just like that. Um, insect eyes are also a lot, um, I, I don't want to necessarily say more complex, but they're very complex and just different with the, you know, the compound eyes. They don't have a, they don't have like one eye structure. They have, um, you know, multiple compact eye structures that make up their whole eye. Um, there's a lot of research there too. Yeah, go ahead. How does the muscle movement work? How does the muscle movement work in the elaborate pupils? Well, this is a really interesting thing. So I had one student, and it was very, very difficult, and the, the work's not quite done yet. Um, we worked on the... Oops, I'm sorry. No, I just... We worked on the skate pupil. Um, and essentially what happens is the skate has a muscle that goes all the way around, but not all the way around. The top sort of seems to be anchored there, but it moves, so it moves the bottom part up. And then this, we've not found much in terms of muscle, but we found a lot of um, blood vessels and things like that. So the suggestion right now is that it's moved, and it takes a while for this to close, um, that it's possibly pushing it down by just sort of adding, you know, blood liquid to it and sort of like basically straightening it out. When this is all the way open, it kind of folds it in an interesting way. Um, but yeah, we don't know yet. We just, it's definitely something that, that we're still working on. Yeah? Mantis shrimp, oh, well, mantis shrimp, I think that is a whole other kettle of fish. Um, I mean, yeah, mantis shrimp are just amazing as far as their visual capabilities are concerned, you know, color vision, polarization vision, etc. Um, but yeah, Mike Buck would be the person to ask. Was he, I don't know when he was here, a couple of years ago, I think, yeah. Do foxes have slit shape or round pupils? Foxes have slit shape pupils for some reason, yeah. And my guess is it's, it's for similar reasons. I know, well the smaller ones have the slit shape, the taller have the, have the round shapes, but foxes aren't cats, but they still have slit shape pupils, interesting. Yeah. Around. 
part of this change? Yeah, the question was whether this structure moves when the pupil, you know, does its thing, and it does, it moves, yeah. So the, the bottom part comes up a little bit and the top closes, so it's a, like a, um, and I, this is that flat head, um, I'd really love to look at that and see what, what ends up happening or whether this actually moves as well. And the same with the peacock um, flounder that we get off here, you know, so nobody knows what the people will do in that animal. Okay, another round of applause for Dr. Lydia Madger. Thank you so much. And also, don't forget, tomorrow night we have a field project activity looking for geckos. You don't want to miss that. And Thursday, the very last presentation. It's all coming to an end. How sad. We appreciate you guys for all of the support that you've been giving us this month. It will be at the um, Busy Bee Breadline Center. Thursday night. Don't miss it. And also, if you would... Please be kind enough to help us move these chairs. We have a big party outside waiting. They're hungry, so let's get them to eat. Thank you, guys. Miami is known as an international community and the hub of trade and logistics for the Caribbean and Americas. A leader in the freight logistics industry, Carib Trans has served the Caribbean region for more than 30 years, with a footprint that has grown from one island to now serving the majority, as well as Central and South America. Carib Trans is an NVOCC, a non-vessel operating common carrier, meaning it has the same responsibilities as a shipper without owning the vessels or planes. Its primary customers, individuals who ship clothing, electronics, and other personal items, and occasionally cars. Most of the stuff that they're sending is because they, they don't get it there. So for us to provide it on two services, air and ocean, we can give them a choice of how fast you want it. So if you ran, want it really fast, we're gonna send it by air, you're gonna have it next day, sometimes even the same day. That on-time service has been the key to carry trend success, whether shipping by air or by sea. The company moves about 5,000 TEUs of freight each year, more than any NVOCC in the region. And since it joined the Saltchuk family of transportation companies a couple years ago, Carib Trans can offer customers even more shipping options. Other NVOCCs, they depend on other uh, shipping lines that are not part of their family. So they need to rely on whether they're gonna sell or not, whether they are late or not. It doesn't happen to us because it's part of our family of, uh, of companies. We, we control the service that we give. Sí, buenos días, por favor, con Diana. Quality service is what keeps customers coming back. Customers are treated like family, and when they leave to research competitors, it doesn't usually last long. They have left and they have come back because they said that, you know, nobody does it better <laughs> than current trends. So because of that relationship. That exceptional service includes consolidation. Customers can have freight sent here and store for free for up to a month, then consolidated and shipped on to the islands and Americas, a perk for the region's growing small business market. Puerto Rico is an expanding market for Carib Trans, about the size of Connecticut and rich in history and culture. Puerto Rico is home to many pharmaceutical manufacturers, as well as a thriving tourism industry for which Carib Trans moves raw materials and supplies. But serving small businesses is still the company's bread and butter here in San Juan. Businesses like Aldera Cafe, a local coffee company, Owner Alfredo Rodriguez started growing coffee beans at his mountain farm about 20 years ago. He recently ordered a variety of new equipment for his farm and shop. He uses Carib Trans because it consolidates shipments, which cuts down on the number of times he has to pay the Puerto Rico import tax. Not many companies want to do that. They want only big cargos and uh, maybe half container or full containers, but they don't, they don't want to consolidate because it's, uh, it's more difficult. Turning challenges into opportunities is what Carib Trans does, and that includes helping to grow small businesses like Caldera Cafe by taking the hassle out of shipping. 
we uh, can be a gateway to expand their, their business in the Caribbean and, and back to the U.S. And wherever they can, they can sell their products, we are also going to be a partner for them. The customer dedication has made Caribtrans what it is today. Now as part of a larger family with more transportation resources, Caribtrans hopes to grow beyond its current market, offering services to additional Latin American ports and eventually Europe and Asia. But even when it becomes a global logistics company, Caribtrans wants to stay true to its roots, always providing personalized, reliable customer service and a commitment to the communities it serves.